Uh, hi, uh, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, session of the Spectral Geometry in the Clouds seminar. Uh, today, it's my uh, pleasure to have uh, Daniel Stern, who will talk to, to us about uh, Stickler maximizing metrics on surfaces with many boundary components. So, Daniel, the floor is yours. Uh, All right. So, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to Jean and Alexander for inviting me back to the seminar. So this is my uh, first time speaking about these results, which are joint with uh, Misha Karpukin. And it's appropriate that I'm speaking about them here because it builds on a lot of things that have been talked about at this, uh, this seminar since it began in uh, spring of 2020. So I mean, we'll, if you've been uh, following the seminar loyally, then you've seen talks by Henrik Matthiasen, previous ones by me, by Jean and Alexander, by Misha Karpukin. And sort of all of those talks will, will feed into uh, what we're talking about today. Um, so it's uh, great to be here. All right, so uh, what's our setup? So let's start by thinking about something which we've discussed in a few different talks in the seminar. Okay, so if we're on a closed Riemannian manifold, then of course we can ask about the first non-trivial eigenvalue of the Laplacian, where Laplacian will always have a positive spectrum. All right, and uh, of course for this we have the variational characterization that uh, this is going to be the infimum of the Rayleigh quotient. Uh, on M, right, of all functions with zero average with respect to our, our volume measure, right? So in particular, it's the reciprocal of our best constant in the Poincaré inequality. All right, that's not new to you. Okay, and for a spectral geometry audience, I don't really have to motivate the study of this, but, uh, you know, in spectral geometry, people are interested in understanding how this lambda one, and of course, higher eigenvalues and eigenvalues of other differential operators, are influenced by the geometry of the manifold. Right, so given some information about other geometric invariants or curvatures and so on, you know, we want to know what we can say about, uh, about this first eigenvalue. For instance. And uh, for this, dimension two is very special because in dimension two, something really strange happens, which is that given just a volume bound and control on the topology of our surface, we have automatic upper bounds on the first eigenvalue. And that's something which, which uh, fails in any higher dimension. So there's something very special to dimension two. Okay. So in particular, um, if we normalize our first eigenvalue by the area of our surface, then we get a scale invariant quantity, this lambda one bar. We just multiply lambda one by the area. And the first observation about this being uh, bounded from above uh, for a fixed topology goes back to Hirsch in the 70s, maybe even the late 60s, but uh, published in 70. So he observed that for any metric on S2, this normalized first eigenvalue is always bounded above by eight pi, which is precisely lambda one bar for the, the round S2, right? And moreover, equality holds if and only if we're around S2, so if we have constant curvature, okay? And uh, the proof, right? Well, uh, many of you have probably seen this, but it's an important one. So in particular, uh, we can always find for any uh, metric on S2, some conformal diffeomorphism to the standard two sphere sitting inside of R3. Okay, and moreover, our conformal automorphism group of S2 is rich enough that uh, we can arrange that the coordinate functions of that map are balanced, right? They have zero average. So in particular, we can test them in the Rayleigh quotient. And what we see is that twice the area of the standard two sphere, which is again, exactly eight pi. Well, that's gonna be the same by conformality as this energy, this Dirichlet energy of our map. But since we can, you know, by our variational definition of lambda one, right, we see that this is bounded from below by lambda one of our given metric times the L2 uh, norm squared, right, of this phi, but phi is taking values in S2, so that phi squared is just one pointwise. So we see that this uh, right-hand side is lambda one bar. Okay, and then squeezing through, you know, understanding what happens in the case of equality, we see that uh, that would have to be an isometry and some particular would have to be a, or a homothety rather, and we see that we'd have to have constant curvature. Okay, so that's Hirsch in 1970. But this is true not just for S2. So uh, later applying a variant of Hirsch's idea, where now you're looking at branched covers from a higher genus surface into S2, uh, Yang and Yao proved a bound which is typically non-sharp, which tells you that lambda one bar for the surface of genus gamma for any metric is bounded above linearly in terms of the genus. Okay, and for the most part, we won't have to worry about exactly what that bound is, okay. Um, so in particular, these are bounded in any orientable surface. And it turns out they're bounded in the non-orientable case as well. So for instance, for a non-orientable analog of Yang Yao, um, you can see work of my collaborator, Misha Kapukin. Okay, so this technique was generalized a bit further by uh, Peter Lee and Xing Tung Yao in their notion of the defining the conformal volume. 
And here, essentially, the idea is to replace Hirsch's trick, where you're looking at maps into S2, and now just look at maps into higher dimensional spheres SN. So now you have a lot more freedom in choosing your initial map, like choose all, any kind of immersion or embedding into SN, and look what happens to it under the conformal automorphism group of SN. So in particular, um, I mean, they, they have a lot of consequences of this conformal volume machinery, but one result that popped out is that if you have an isometric minimal immersion of your given surface into SN by first eigen functions of the Laplacian, then in fact, the metric has to be uh, a maximizer for this lambda one bar and its conformal class. So lambda one bar of this given metric, which is induced by this minimal immersion by first eigen functions, is bounded below by lambda one bar for any other metric conformal to that. So in particular, if you just have one conformal structure, like on RP2, and if you have some minimal immersion by uh, first eigen functions, which you do in the case of RP2 and S4 by the Veronese embedding, right? then in fact, you can see that the round metric in this case has to maximize lambda one bar uh, on RP2. Okay, so so far we've identified maximizing metrics uh, on these special cases of S2 and RP2 where we only have one conformal structure. Okay, well then in the mid 90s, another Ashvili pushed things a little further and he was able to find the maximizing metric on the torus. Okay, so now we have a non-trivial Teichmuller space, life gets a little more interesting. And he's able to show that the, this lambda one bar is maximized by the flat equilateral torus. This had been conjectured uh, back in the 70s, I think, by Berger. In this case, the argument's quite different from what was done by, uh, you know, in all these sort of previous Hirsch type comparison arguments. So in particular, he first argues that a maximizing metric should exist. So if you try to maximize this lambda one bar function, you can indeed produce the maximizing metric. And then he observes that any such maximizing metric, and more general, any metric which is critical for this lambda one bar in an appropriate sense, has to be a minimal immersion into some sphere by first eigenfunctions. Or excuse me, it has to, uh, must be induced by a minimal immersion into some sphere by first eigenfunctions. Okay? But then in the case of the torus, minimal immersions by first eigenfunctions into spheres have been classified by Montiel and Ross a while before. And so he's able to look at the only two you have, right, and conclude that uh, the maximizer among all metrics must be the same as the maximizer among flat metrics. And it's precisely this uh, flat equilateral force. Okay. All right, so then uh, a little while later, uh, Jacobson, Nadarashvili, and Polterovich, and El Sufi, Giacomini, and Jazar uh, were able to use similar techniques to identify a maximal metric on the Klein bottle, which is induced by a minimal embedding into S4, which had been constructed by uh, Lawson and sort of another pile of families. Um, I, I noted here that this one's non-flat, right? So if you just knew the previous three examples, you might think that maybe maximizing among all metrics turns out to be the same as maximizing among uh, constant curvature ones, right? But uh, in this case, you see that that's not the case. You get interesting new things that you wouldn't get just by looking at sort of, you know, uniformizing and taking the maximum there. Okay. And then the only other example where the explicit maximizer is currently known is on the closed surface of genus two. So in this case, Nayatani and Shoda show that the Yang-Yao inequality is actually equality for some metrics. And in particular, there are branched covers of S2 uh, for which the induced singular metric um, maximizes this lambda one bar. Okay, so in particular, if you're looking at maximizes of lambda one bar, you have to allow for the possibility of some conical singularities, or in other words, some branch points in these minimal surfaces that you're producing. Okay. So that's the story where we know explicit maximizers. But uh, fortunately, in recent years, we now have a general existence theory, which tells us that we can always find some maximizer, even if we don't necessarily know what it is all the time. So in particular, for the conformal maximization problem, this was resolved by uh, Petridis in 2014. And then there are also now other proofs by uh, Karpukin, Nadarashvili, Fenskoy, and Voltarovich, and some other ones by Karpukin and myself um, using different techniques. But anyway, the punchline is that for uh, any conformal class on a closed surface, there's going to be some lambda one bar conformally maximizing metric, and this could have some conical singularities, right? So which is going to achieve this maximum, right? So we write lambda one of M conformal class to denote the conformal supremum of this quantity. And this is going to come with naturally a harmonic map from this conformal structure into SN by some first eigen functions of, uh, of Laplacian. Okay, so note that we're just asking harmonic here. If we ask it likewise be conformal, then we'd get this, this minimal. Right? And I'll note here that this n right, is bounded in terms of the topology of m. 
And this comes from some classical, for instance, uh, bounds by Chung, which tell us that um, the multiplicity of any fixed, uh, of, you know, for, so for lambda one, the multiplicity of first eigenfunctions always has a bound in terms of the genus, for instance. And similarly for higher eigenvalues, the, the multiplicity is always bounded in terms of the genus. Okay. So uh, with the conformal case settled, uh, building on Petridis's work, Matthias and Zippert uh, did some deep work to show that in fact, the global uh, maximization problem can be resolved as well. So we know we can maximize each conformal class. Now you have to maximize overall conformal structures. And so they showed in particular that on any closed surface, there does exist a maximizing metric. And again, this could have some finite number of conical singularities. Okay, which achieves this maximum, which we'll write as lambda one of M when we're forgetting about the conformal part. And it's going to admit uh, a potentially branched uh, isometric minimal immersion into some sphere by first eigenfunctions. Okay, so again, this observation of, uh, of Nader Eschbieler. Okay, so now we know that this maximization problem can always be solved. And sort of as an aside, I'll note that there's a similar theory for maximizing higher eigenvalues but in general, you don't expect to get sort of nice metrics, even with conical singularity of maximizing these. You expect to get sort of configurations where your surface can split up into different pieces and you get some bubbling phenomena and stuff. So somehow the first eigenvalue is the case where this is best understood and where you expect the most regularity from your, uh, your maximizing metrics. And they give you in particular these minimal emotions. All right, so that's the story for maximization of lambda one. In recent years, there's been an exciting parallel story that was initiated by Fraser and Shane for the Steklov spectrum on surfaces of boundary. So in particular, recall that if we have a surface of boundary, then the Steklov spectrum is just the spectrum of the Dirichlet and Neumann map. So where we take a function on the boundary of N, we take its harmonic extension to the interior, and then we look at the Neumann data for that harmonic extension. So we take the normal derivative of this phi hat. Okay, so now we have this non-local operator, which is depending on sort of the full geometry of the boundary and then the conformal structure of the interior. And uh, even though it's non-local, these eigenvalues, and in particular the first eigenvalue, have a simple variational characterization, much like what we get for the Laplacian eigenvalues. All right, so in particular, the sigma one is given by, well, now instead of being an optimal constant for an interior point array type inequality, now it's the infimum of this Rayleigh quotient where we again take the Dirichlet energy over the interior, but now the L2 part of our Rayleigh quotient is the L2 norm on the boundary, okay? And we take the infimum of this over functions, uh, I should include here probably a non-zero to avoid uh, perversity, right? Non-zero functions whose average on the boundary is zero. Okay, so in particular, um, it's very much parallel to our, definite, to our variational characterization of lambda one, right? But where the volume measure in these L2 norms and in the balancing, are replaced by the length measure of the boundary. Okay. So uh, now in this case, if we normalize by the length, that turns out to be the most natural normalization, you get a scale invariant quantity, sigma one bar. All right. And we can start to look at isoparametric problems for this quantity. So isoparametric and the upper bounds for the sigma one bar go back to work of Weinstock in the 50s, characterizing disk as the maximizer among uh, that the round disk is the maximizer among all topological disks in, uh, in the plane. But then uh, a little while back in 2009, Fraser and Shane observed that the variational theory for the sigma one bar has a lot of really interesting parallels with that for lambda one bar on closed surfaces. So in particular, um, the first key observation is that if G is a maximizing metric for sigma one bar on the surface of boundary N, then G has to be induced now by a free boundary minimal immersion uh, into the unit ball for some dimension n. Okay. So let's recall what free boundary minimal immersion means. So remember when we did this Laplacian maximization, we got these closed minimal surfaces in the sphere, which means a surface in the sphere with, you know, well, the PDE form just tells you it has vanishing mean curvature in the sphere. But what this is telling us is that if we push it around by diffeomorphisms in the sphere, it's going to be a critical point for the area. To be a free boundary minimal immersion in the ball, is telling you that you're a surface in the ball, your boundary is contained in the boundary sphere, and when you push it around by diffeomorphisms of the ball that preserve the sphere, so they still, you know, because they restrict the diffeomorphisms of the boundary sphere, then you're a critical point for the area functional under those kind of perturbations, where your boundary is required to stay in the boundary sphere. 
at the BDE level, this tells you that you have zero mean curvature in Euclidean space, and you meet the boundary orthogonal. Okay. So maximizing uh, these Steklov eigenvalues, you get these free boundary minimal emergence, which are going to be um, given precisely by the first Steklov eigenfunctions. Okay. And uh, moreover, I'll note, because this will be very important for us later, that there's an upper bound on the dimension of this ball that you're mapping into, which depends only on the genus of n. Okay, so somehow the same kind of arguments that uh, Chung used to show uh, this you know, uniform bound on the multiplicity of, eigen, of Laplace eigenvalues, you can get uniform bounds on the Steklov, multiplicity of Steklov eigenvalues, and those won't depend on the number of boundary components. Okay. All right, so now we have a nice existence theory for these guys as well. So combining the work of Fraser Shane, uh, Roman Petridis, and Henrik Matthias and Roman Petridis, we now know that these sigma one bar maximizing metrics exist on any surface of boundary. Okay, so in particular, this was completed by Matthias and Petridis last year. So on any surface of boundary, there's going to be some metric, again, possibly with some conical singularities corresponding to some branch points of this minimal surface, which is gonna maximize a sigma one bar and it's going to be induced by, a, uh, again, possibly branched free boundary minimal immersion into some ball by first Steklov eigenfunctions for uh, this maximizing method. Okay, so that's good news. So this problem, this existence problem can be solved. Um, all right, so we can denote this maximum by sigma one of n. So it's gonna be the maximum of the sigma one bar overall metrics. So the explicit maximizers are known in this case for even fewer topologies then we know the Laplacian maximizers in the closed case. So these have been characterized for the disk by Weinstock, for the annulus by Fraser and Shane, as given by this critical catenoid in the free ball, and the Merbius band. So there's a critical Merbius band in a higher dimension of the ball that was characterized by Fraser and Shane as the maximum uh, for the first Steklov eigenvalue among all Merbius bands. Let's see, I haven't missed any, have I? I think those are the only three, right? Okay, okay, if someone else knows one, let me know. <laughs> All right. I think they're the only three. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so these are the three examples where we know explicitly what the sigma one bar maximizing metric is, and what the, in particular the corresponding free boundary minimal surfaces are. All right. So, if we don't know explicit examples, well, we can try to find more. But another thing we can do is start looking at asymptotics. Right. So, in particular, um, we can ask if we start taking parameters like the genus of a number of boundary components, getting very, very large, what can we say about the asymptotic behavior? these maximizing metrics. The question about taking the genus large is an interesting one, which I have uh, you know, nothing useful to say about today. Um, but uh, we're going to be interested in this question of what happens if we fix genus and take the number of boundary components becoming large. And this turns out to be a very natural one. It was considered uh, you know, by Fraser and Shane in earlier work. And recently, there's been a lot of progress in understanding this. So uh, in particular, um, OK, so let's you know, make our setting explicit. All right, so let's suppose we have a closed surface M, and we're going to consider these surfaces N sub K, which are going to be the compact surfaces of K boundary components, given by removing a collection of K disks from this closed surface M. So for instance, if we're orientable, then M is just you know, a closed surface of genus gamma, and N is going to be the surface of genus gamma and K boundary components. Okay. So last year, there were two important results uh, relating the Seklov maximum quantity on NK, to the maximum Laplace eigenvalue on M. Okay, and if you're loyal followers of the seminar, you've heard about all this before. But, uh, all right, so one of these uh, by uh, Misha Karpukin and myself is building on some uh, general machinery for relating these Laplacean maximization problems to the variational theory for harmonic maps. Uh, as a, a little output, we were able to show that the sigma one of NK is always bounded from above uh, by lambda one of M. So in particular, the maximum Steklov eigenvalue on this uh, surface of K boundary components is always less than the maximum Laplace eigenvalue you get on the closed surface by filling in the holes. Okay, and there's also a more streamlined approach to this by uh, Giro Rodgapukin and Lagasse, which removes sort of the uh, reliance on this min-max construction. Okay. Um, then uh, around the same time, Giro Rod and Lagasse, our organizers, showed that uh, if you take the limit as k goes to infinity of these sigma one of nk, that's always bounded from below by lambda one of n. So in particular on any, and again, in this case, it's also a consequence of more general results where they show on any Riemannian manifold m, you can find a family of uh, domains inside for which the uh, Steklov spectrum converges 
and delimit the Laplace spectrum of the uh, the closed guy. So in particular, if you put these together, you'll see that the limit of the sigma one of nk coincides with lambda one of m. So if we're fixing the genus and taking the number of boundary components until going to infinity, we get an increasing sequence converging to this uh, Laplacian maximum. Okay. So both proofs make use, maybe somewhat implicitly, of the fact that these Laplacian eigenvalues and Steklov eigenvalues uh, have the same kind of variational characterization. So in general, if we have you know, our conformal structure on some closed surface M and some measure mu, we can write down these eigenvalues where we take the infima of this Rayleigh quotient where we're taking just the usual Dirichlet energy of F and uh, our you know, L2 part with respect to this measure mu. And we ask that our function be balanced with respect to mu. Okay, All right, and as we discussed, right, the first Laplacian eigenvalue, this corresponds to uh, the case where we're taking mu to be the volume measure for a given metric in this class. And the second level eigenvalue corresponds to the case where we're letting mu be the boundary length measure on the boundary event. Okay, so the, the idea behind what uh, Alexander and Jean did is they uh, figured out, well, by drilling lots of small holes in this closed surface M, they can find a sequence of domains whose boundary length measures are going to converge to the area measure, in particular, in the dual of W1P strongly, right, for any P bigger than one, and such that the harmonic extension operator of uh, W12 of this domain omega k into the complement is going to have vanishing norm as k goes to infinity. So somehow we can extend functions in such a way that we don't increase their any area very much as k goes to infinity to the whole manifold. Um, and this is enough to see that you get convergence of the associated spectrum for these measures. Right? And so there's a more general theory for this kind of thing developed by uh, Gio, Rod, Kapukin, and Lagasse a little later in the year. Right, so in particular, that's enough to conclude that the first Steklov eigenvalue of these domains converges to the first Laplacian eigenvalue of the closed guy. And uh, taking this uh, G on the closed guy, right, our metric on the closed one, to be a lambda one bar maximizing metric, then we get this relation where we see that, well, then the limb soup of these sigma one bars for these domains is going to be bigger than or equal to lambda one of m in the limit. But then, of course, this is going to be bounded from above by the limb soup of these uh, sigma one of nks, the maximum of the sequel eigenvalues. Okay, so that's where this relation comes from. All right, the, uh, the other relation, um, at least in the original form, comes from a more uh, general rigidity result for eigenvalues of measures with a maximization problem. So again, building on this, uh, this sort of connection between the variational theory of harmonic maps and these eigenvalue maximization problems, Misha and I were able to show that uh, for a certain large class of measures, we don't need to get into what that class is, but it includes in particular the length measures of curves on a closed surface with some conformal structure. It's always true that the sort of normalized first eigenvalue associated with that measure is bounded from above by the conformal max of the normalized eigenvalues over the, uh, the smooth metrics. And moreover, quality holds if and only if that measure is a smooth, uh, is you know, the volume measure for a smooth maximizing metric. Okay? So somehow this is telling us that if we expand our eigenvalue maximization to a, a larger pool of measures, we aren't getting anything new. Okay? And so then we can apply this, for instance, to the case where mu is the uh, boundary measure of some domain inside M. And in particular, we can always realize any surface, you know, if the surface is topologically given by removing k disks from m, and for any metric on that surface of boundary, we can always extend it to some smooth metric on the interior, right? We can extend it to some smooth metric by filling in the holes. And we see that in that case, the uh, normalized first eigenvalue of that uh, surface of boundary, well, that's going to be strictly bounded from above by the first eigenvalue normalized associated to its length measure inside um, the closed surface. So the reason that's strict is because when we look at the length measure inside the closed surface, that eigenvalue takes into account bits of Dirichlet energy from the interior of domain and its complement. Okay, and that's actually going to be uh, an important distinction later. Okay. Um, and in particular, that's going to be, well, by this result, strictly less than this uh, informal max. And then taking this maximum to be just the uh, 
you know, just not just the conformal maximum, but the maximum over all conformal classes, we get this strict inequality. Okay, so that's where that comes from. All right, so what do we see now? So now we know that we have an existence theory for the Steklov maximization problem and the Laplacian maximization problem for the first eigenvalues. And we know that as we fix genus and take number of boundary components going to infinity, the corresponding eigenvalues, or equivalently the areas of the corresponding free boundary minimal surfaces in the ball are going to converge to the area of the corresponding minimal surface in the sphere given by uh, maximization of the Laplacian eigenvalue. So that's the situation, right? So we have these, uh, these free boundary minimal surfaces in the Euclidean ball of fixed dimension, right? Remember we said it was important that this, the dimension of this ball is gonna be fixed independent of the number of boundary components. And we know that the limit of the area of these free boundary minimal surfaces is gonna be exactly half lambda one of n. In other words, the area of the closed minimal surface in the sphere we get by, uh, by maximizing Laplacian eigenvalues. Okay, so by general results in uh, minimal surface theory or geometric measure theory, and you can say that these gamma k, these free boundary minimal surfaces, well, just by virtue of the area bound, they're going to have to converge in some weak sense. And the right notion there, for instance, is verifold convergence. If you don't know verifolds, don't worry, you won't need to know them for this talk. We'll get to something you can sink your teeth and do more later. Um, but they're going to converge to some notion of weak minimal surface uh, in this closed unit ball of area that says lambda 1 of m, but that should be half lambda 1. Okay? So the areas will have to converge into lambda. Okay, well now let's just note that any closed minimal surface in this boundary sphere, like the ones, for instance, given by maximizing lambda one, is gonna satisfy the weak characterization of a free boundary minimal surface in the ball. So in, if the weak formulation of being a free boundary minimal surface in the ball is that you're some surface inside this closed ball, such that when I push you around by diffeomorphisms that preserve the boundary sphere, you're a critical point for the area functional under those kinds of perturbations. But if you're just sitting, a surface sitting inside the boundary sphere to begin with, this just means that you're a surface inside the sphere, which is a critical point of the area under diffeomorphisms of the sphere, which is precisely the weak characterization of being a closed minimal surface in the sphere. Okay, so in particular, a priori, this limit, which is just some weak notion of free boundary minimal surface in the ball, could be, a closed minimal surface in the sphere. And in fact, we know of a closed minimal surface in the sphere which has this area because it's the one given by uh, maximizing the Laplace and eigenvalue. Okay, so we could raise a question. Do the free boundary minimal surfaces uh, in dn plus one induced by the sigma one bar maximizing metric on nk, do they converge in an appropriate sense as k goes to infinity to the minimal surface in Sn arising from maximization of lambda one bar? And uh, I think John and Alexander raised this as a conjecture for the genus zero case in their paper, right? Where in that case, the closed minimal surface in the boundary just literally means the boundary sphere S2 itself uh, for the ball B3. Okay. And so the, the first main result I want to talk about today is an affirmative answer. Together with Misha Kafukin, we were able to confirm this. So uh, let's see. Oh, John, are you unmuting for a question? Yes, yes, I have a quick question here. Uh, Actually, something I was uh, discussing with Alexandre yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so here, and, and and you have mentioned this in in, in your previous slide. You, you say the minimal surface ob obtained from a maximizing. Metric. Oh no, no, no. So, so we don't have a guarantee of uniqueness in general. Yeah, but and even if it's up to subsequence, um, may, may, maybe it's just known, and I I don't know. It is the the space of all these maximal metrics compact in some sense uh, and all that so that you can ensure that you have a, a convergence at the end or or yes uh, so so for instance if you have a minimal immersion by first eigen functions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's a result that is extensively like branch ones as well the result of uh i believe montiel and ross that it's mm -hmm. unique in its conformal class up to um you know isometries of spheres yeah, yeah, of course, up to isometry. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so then the question is, do you have compactness in the space of maximizing conformal classes? Mm -hmm. But that follows from, um, you know, Matthias and Ziffert's result in Petridis' analysis, 
which tells you that as long as you have this strict inequality that was proved by uh, Matthias and Ziffert, then you can't, your conformal classes can't escape to the boundary of type void space. So the space of conformal classes has to be compact. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, okay. Okay. is that good? Uh, I mean, it, it, it definitely answers uh, this question I have. Okay, great. That's right. So, yeah, so I, I said that's, that's a very good point, though. So I'm saying the minimal surfaces here. Uh, so, you know, this isn't a, a unique one, right? It's just, uh, although in most of the cases where we know it explicitly, except for genus two, these are unique up to isometries. But uh, in general, we don't know that. Okay. That's a very good point. In any case, we have this convergence subsequently to minimal surfaces in the sphere given by maximizing Laplace and eigenvalues. Okay, so in other words, we knew already the convergence of the corresponding numbers. Now we know that the actual, you know, maximizing metrics and the associated minimal surfaces converge in a weak sense. Maybe I should uh, quickly pause here to note that, you know, the convergence can only be in a very weak sense because it's easy to see by examining the conditions of what it means to be a free boundary minimal surface in the ball and a minimal surface in the sphere that somehow, um, you know, having vanishing mean curvature in a sphere and vanishing mean curvature in the ball are completely incompatible in a C2 sense. So if you have a free boundary minimal immersion in the ball and the minimal surface in the sphere, they can nowhere be close in C2. Or since these you know, free boundary guys have to meet the sphere orthogonally, you know, at least near the boundary, they're not going to be anywhere close in C1. So you can only expect this convergence in, the, in a weak sense, sort of the variable sense, the natural you know, first topology that you can expect. Okay. And again, if you don't know variables, we'll get to something more concrete than convergence of max later. Okay. All right. So in particular, as a consequence, even though we only know the explicit Steklov maximizers for three topologies, now we have some asymptotic description of the maximizing metrics uh, whenever we have uh, you know, fixed genus and many boundary components. So for instance, uh, for the genus zero case, the sigma one maximizing metrics of genus zero and K boundary components are going to converge as K goes to infinity to this, uh, just the boundary S2 in the three ball. All right, so this is confirming this conjecture of uh, Alexander and Jean. Okay, similarly, if we're looking at now the sigma one maximizing metrics on the surface of genus one and K boundary components, right, these are gonna be some free boundary minimal surfaces in the six dimensional ball, converging to the minimal flat equilateral torus in uh, S5. Okay, and then of course, you know, we can state similar things when the closed guy that we get by filling in the holes is RP2 or the Klein bottle or the oriented surface of genus two. Whenever we know the Laplacian maximizer, now we have some asymptotic description of the step level maximizer. Okay, so uh, let's discuss a bit of the proof. So a key ingredient um, are these results that we proved with uh, Mikhail Nahon and Josef Polterovich that Misha talked about a few months ago in the seminar. We we're understanding stability for the maximization of eigenvalues problem. So you can ask, you know, given some metric, or more generally some measure, you know, whose normalized first eigenvalue is close to the maximum eigenvalue, does that metric or that measure have to be close in any meaningful sense to, the, to an actual maximizing metric? So we get some positive answers where the right notion of closeness is basically the dual of the W12. Okay. So in particular, most important for our purposes now is this uh, qualitative stability result. Okay, so it looks like a lot, but it's not so bad. So if we have some conformal classes and some measures, which I'm calling here admissible measures, but the point is some class which includes you know, links, link measures of curves and you know, volume measures on this closed surface, such that these normalized first eigenvalues converge to the maximum overall uh, overall first eigenvalues. Then there's going to be some maximizing metric, which is up to subsequences, and we have to sort of mod out by the natural action of the diffeomorphism group of M. We have these conformal classes converge in type molar space. So in other words, their constant curvature representatives converge smoothly. And the associated measures have to converge to the uh, volume measure of this maximizing metric in the dual of W12, and it's a strong convergence. So that's this qualitative stability, and morally, all, you know, all of our results in this paper have the form that closeness of the eigenvalues to the max forces closeness to a maximizing, you know, measure or metric in W12 dual. Okay, and that's essentially sharp. But for our purposes, what would we like now? We'd like to realize our Steklov maximizing metrics as domains inside of this closed surface M in some natural way, and apply these stability results to this sequence of measures we get by their length measures, and then somehow squeeze something out of that that we can use to show convergence 
of the associated free boundary minimal versions to these minimal guys in the sphere. Okay, so first it's going to be helpful to have some canonical way of realizing our Steklov maximizing metrics on these surfaces of the boundary as sort of objects inside this closed surface. So we always know that we can sort of extend them, you know, in some random way, but we'd like a sort of natural way of doing this. And fortunately, there's a uniformization result which allows us to do this. So in the case of S2, this would just be Kirby uniformization. Uh, for higher genus, it seems to be less known, but it was done by, for instance, Maskit, which is we can always realize any compact surface of boundary as the complement, we realize it conformally, I should say, we can conformally map it to the complement of some collection of geodesic disks in a closed surface of constant curvature. Right, so in particular, these NKs, any metric on them, we can identify it conformally with M with these K geodesic disks removed. And moreover, um, this realization is going to be unique up to sort of conform automorphisms of the closed surface M. Okay? So it gives us some natural way of viewing these N as sitting inside of the closed surface. Okay, so we're going to make use of that. All right, so in particular, we can identify these, the sigma 1 bar maximizing metric on NK conformally with some domain inside of M comma HK, given by removing KG that exists, where this HK is some constant curvature metric. Okay. All right. Well, then what do we know? Well, then by um, Alexander and Jean's result, for instance, we know that the length measure of these guys times the first eigenvalue associated to this conformal structure HK and this boundary measure. Well, that's going to be bigger than or equal to the, uh, the limit of these first Steklov eigenvalues of NKGK. But that's exactly sigma 1 of NK, so it's going to be lambda 1 of M. So what, what am I saying here? We have, we know that the normalized first eigenvalues of these measures, these conformal classes, is going to be converging to this lambda 1 of M. So we can apply our qualitative stability results to see that, well, these constant curvature metrics have to converge smoothly, right? The conformal classes are converging in tight closed space. And there's a lambda one bar maximizing metric uh, such that the measures are going to converge. That the length measures of these boundary curves right, is going to converge to this uh, volume measure of the maximizing metric in W12 dual, say, with respect to this limiting reference metric H0. Yeah, remember, H0 is just a constant curvature metric formal to our maximizing metric. OK. So the point is we can do this realization where now we have nice W12 dual convergence of the measures. And we have a nice smooth convergence of the conformal normal classes. OK. So what do we get from here? Well, now if we look at suitable test functions and apply you know, in, in the convergence, we have this W12 dual convergence of the length measures to the volume measure in the limit. So we can plug you know, nice test functions into that convergence statement. And we're able to see that the length of each boundary component of this boundary of the you know, Steklov maximizing metric on the surface of the boundary has to vanish as k goes to infinity, right? So the total length of the boundary we know is bounded. So if we knew that all of the, you know, uh, boundary components had comparable length, this would be automatic because each of them would have to have length like length like one over k. But we don't know that a priori. Fortunately, we can do a little work to see that at least uh, the length of each component is vanishing as k goes to infinity. And since the total length is bounded, we can conclude from there that the sum of the length squared of these boundary components is vanishing as k goes to infinity. Okay, well then, isoparametric stuff gives us a little more information. So we now can look at these free boundary minimal immersions that are inducing our Steklov maximizing metrics. And since the sum of the length squared of their boundary curves is going to a zero, as k goes to infinity, that means we can find fill-ins such that the area on those fill-ins, those disks, is going to be going to zero. So we can cap off those free boundary minimal immersions to maps from our closed surface into the unit ball without adding much area, without a negligible area as k goes to infinity. Okay, so that's good news. So in particular, we can replace our conformal structure on a given surface with one by perturbing it slightly, such that you know, this omega, this, we're still identifying our surface of boundary conformally uh, uh, with this domain of inside the M. But now we can do that in such a way that we identify the energy of this map with the area, maybe up to some little error. And so now we get that we have this family of metrics where uh, we can apply stability again. And we have that the energy of the extension of this free boundary minimal immersion to the complement, like to these remaining holes, is vanishing as k goes to infinity. 
Okay, so we can extend it with negligible er uh, energy. Okay, so finally we see that, uh, okay, well these uh, UK hats have to converge weakly in the limit to some limiting map from our closed surface M into the N plus one. Okay, but then if we put together the fact that these free boundary minimal immersions are conformal maps by sigma one eigenfunctions, and that they have vanishing energy on the complement, right, their extension is vanishing energy, so we can sort of ignore it for W12 purposes. Okay, if we use the fact that these guys are, uh, you know, point-wise taking values in the sphere almost everywhere for the boundary measure, right, they're mapping the boundary into the SN. And crucially, that the boundary measures are converging to the area measure of this uh, maximizing uh, metric strongly in the dual of W12. So we have all these weak convergence statements for the maps and for quantities associated to the maps, but we have strong convergence for the measures. And we're going to be repeatedly using the fact that if we have a weakly convergent sequence of functions in W12 and a strongly convergent sequence of measures in the dual of W12, then the limits commute, right, when we pair those things. Okay, so using that kind of argument repeatedly and, you know, using what we know that the uh, first Steklov eigenvalue and the converge to the first Laplacian eigenvalue, then we're able to deduce with a little work, but not too much, that the limit map is going to be a conformal harmonic map to Sn by lambda one first eigenfunctions. And that gives us exactly this theorem A. So, uh, you know, I, without going into what varifolds are, varifold convergence follows easily. But if you don't like varifolds, all you need to know is we can take these free boundary minimal versions, realize them as maps from some domain inside of M into the ball, fill them in with negligible energy, and get strong W12 convergence in the limit to this branched minimal immersion into the sphere. Okay, so it's just a statement about convergence of maps at the end. Okay. All right. So as a corollary of the uh, verifold convergence, you know, one sort of maybe, you know, concrete statement you can see from that is that the supports of these free boundary minimal surfaces are going to converge, you know, in the Hausdorff sense to the support of the minimal surface in SN realizing lambda one of M. Okay, that's just sort of a straightforward consequence of the fairfold convergence for, uh, for free boundary minimal surfaces. Okay, so that's that's my sketch of the proof of theorem. Might people have questions before we move on to other quantitative things? All right, then let's keep chugging along. All right, so in addition to uh, getting this nice convergence statement, uh, we're able to get um, a little more quantitative version of this fact that these eigenvalues sigma one of nk converge to the max Laplacian eigenvalue on the closed guy. So we're able to get some rate of convergence in particular. So uh, we show, well, first of all, for any closed surface, rate of nk is this surface uh, given by removing k disks, then the gap between lambda one of n and sigma one of nk is going to be bounded above by some constant times log k over k. Okay. And in fact, we proved that for uh, for higher eigenvalues as well. So you can make the same statement for lambda j and then sigma j where you look at taking the max over higher eigenvalues on the spectrum. All right, so log k over k is a nice rate of convergence. And moreover, if we take this closed model M to be S2, RP2, T2, or the Klein bottle k, so all the examples where we actually know the maximizer, except for the surface of genus two, which is kind of a pest, um, we get the corresponding lower bound. So not only is this gap, you know, big O of log K over K, but in fact, we have a corresponding log K over K lower bound. So that's the right rate of convergence. Okay. All right. Is, so um, is, 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 is this related to the fact that you have uniqueness in those cases of the maximizer up to isometries or? Uh... It is, and it's somehow related to the fact that and this appears in our paper with um, with uh, Nahon and Volterovich as well. Um, but it's related to the fact that we have basically some nice comparison families. Mm -hmm. So somehow, you know, for S2 and RP2, we have sort of Hirsch's trick and the, um, you know, the conformal volume characterization of the maximal metric on RP2 and sort of, you know, squeeze, you know, squeeze out a quantitative version of, um, you know, what Lee, Yao, or Hirsch did. For T2, and um, the Klein bottle, we in addition have to have sort of an extent, nice extension of these families uh, in the directions which change the conformal, conformal uh, structure as well. 
Mm -hmm. um, but there's sort of nice natural families that do it in that case. Okay, so, so we're using the fact that we have sort of some nice explicit comparison there. So let's talk about this, uh, this upper bound, which is going to be independent of the topology of this closed surface set. So uh, the idea, well, to show this upper bound, right, we just need to find some metric on nk, which uh, is within you know, log k over k of the maximizing metric on, on uh, m. Right? So we just need to provide some metric for which this holds, and then clearly the soup satisfies this bound as well. Right? So here we're, we follow uh, uh, John and Alexander for a large part and just optimize a few things. Okay. So similar to what John and Alexander did, we start by fixing some reference metric on M, which uh, you know, for which the associated conformal vault class realizes the maximum of lambda one over all conformal classes. And we select the domain inside of M by removing K geodesic disks uh, of small radius. Okay, so in our case we choose that radius to be like K to the minus three halves. That minus three halves isn't super important, it's just sort of is useful for technical um, really, any any power of one over k bigger than one should do. Okay, okay and and more importantly, we ask the distance between the centers of those disks be like square root of k. So somehow these are points which are um, you know separated, you know equidistant in uh, in M. Right. So this is very similar to what John and Alexander did. All right. The thing is now in John and Alexander's original paper, they're um, you know just taking the uh, you know, the, the metric, the metric on these domains induced by the metric on the closed guy. In our case, we're going to apply a little conformal change too. So how do we choose our conformal change? So if G max is the lambda one bar maximizing metric, conformal to G naught, then we choose a conformal factor on our domain omega K, satisfying the following rule. So all that really matters is what it does on the boundary. And we say that if we integrate some function chi against this conformal factor on the boundary, that's going to be equal to the integral of the harmonic extension of chi into the domain against the volume of the lambda one maximizing metric. Okay, so why do we do this? Well, we know from our experience with these stability results that having an eigenvalue close to the max is gonna be related to have, having your measure being close in an H minus one sense or in a W12 dual sense, right, to the maximizing measure. So what this conformal factor does is it's going to minimize the distance in W12 of our domain dual from the, maximize, from the volume measure of the maximizing metric to the length measure of the boundary. So we're choosing our conformal factor which somehow minimizes this H minus one difference between the volume measure of the maximizing guy and the length measure of the boundary. So that's where this conformal factor comes from. And then with some work, okay, so we can check that, um, uh, since now we need to check that these eigenvalues satisfy the desired lower bound, right? So the normalized first eigenvalue is bounded from below by this capital lambda one up to some log k over k error. So first you can check that the length measures, excuse me, the total length sort of is trivially within one over k squared of the area. That's an easy one. And then um, with more work, you can show that the eigenfunctions, the first eigenfunctions for a maximizing metric are what you could call O of log k over k quasi-modes for the Dirichlet and Neumann map on omega k g tilde. So in an appropriate quantitative sense, they're close to being Steklov eigenfunctions with eigenvalue close to lambda 1. Okay, so in other words, if we look at um, sort of the deficit between the pairing of, um, you know, the, the Dirichlet pairing of d phi with D of some harmonic function in omega k, and look at the difference between that and lambda one and this L2 pairing of B with that function on the boundary with respect to our you know, nice control metric, then that's always going to be within log k over k. Um, there's a low log k over k error in terms of the W12 norm of B and the W12 norm of that harmonic function. And really, we want this, you know, we should replace this W12 with something like you know, the energy in the, you know, it's a W12 where the L2 part comes from the L2 norm of the boundary or something. So that's a, trivial difference. Okay, so the point is we can show that all of the first eigenfunctions uh, for our uh, for our Laplacian of the maximum guy are going to be log k over k close to some uh, Steklov eigenfunctions on this domain with the conformal factor we chose 
uh, with eigenvalue you know, within log k over k of lambda 1. So in particular with little work, you can show that there must be at least as many step blob eigenvalues of omega k with this conformal factor within log k over k of lambda 1 as there are first eigenvalues of the Laplacian of this maximizing metric. Okay, then you argue that if there were some other non-trivial Steklov eigenfunctions between zero and outside of this, you know, log k over k range of lambda one, well, in arguing sort of in a similar way to what John and Alexander do, you say that these extra eigenfunctions would limit to extra eigen extra first eigenfunctions of the Laplacian in the limit. So in particular, you know, we already have multiplicity of lambda one eigen eigenfunctions uh, with, within log k over k of lambda one. If we had an extra one that fell outside that range and was below lambda one, then we would get too many lambda one eigenfunctions of the limit. Okay. So in particular, um, this tells us that the first non-trivial Steklov eigenfunction of these omega k g tildes have to be within log k over k of that lambda one. Okay. And that completes that. So that's the upper bound. Again, that holds for arbitrary closed M, and um, it's easy to extend it to higher eigenvalues as well. Okay. So um, the lower bound on the gap is interesting, and it uh, builds on some of the techniques that we developed with uh, Mikhail Mahone and Josef Polterovich. But anyway, we have to tweak a little bit to the Steklov setting. So to keep life simple, I'm going to illustrate this just in the genus zero case. We're taking M to BS2. Um, and then I already discussed a little bit with John about how to extend that to the, the other uh, topologies we can prove it for. I can say a little bit more about that in questions that people want. Okay, well, let's focus on the S2 case. So the starting point, which is similar to the starting point we had with uh, Mikhail Mahon and Yosef Polterovich, is some kind of quantitative version of the Hirsch lemma. But in this case, uh, with, uh, with Mikhail and Yosef, um, somehow we we're looking at measures, we we're looking at eigenvalues defined with respect to all of the closed surface and not with respect to domains stuck inside. Okay? It's going to be important in this case that we're looking just at the domains it's strictly contained in M. Okay, so uh, suppose omega is in domain, let G tell to be a metric on omega, such that the boundary length measure is balanced with respect to the, um, the coordinate functions of S2. Right? And certainly we can, um, we can always arrange that up to some formal automorphism. Then uh, setting sigma one to be the first Steklov eigenvalue of the domain of that metric, we have the following. So the W12 different, W12 dual difference squared of that boundary length measure and the two times the volume measure of a standard metric restricted to that domain, plus the area of the complement S2 minus uh, omega is gonna be controlled by the gap from the, the distant difference between eight pi, right, the max eigenvalue on S2, and the sigma one bar, the, the normalized Steklov eigenvalue of the domain. So the difference, for those of you who remember uh, Misha's talk about the work with uh, Mikhail and Yosef, the difference here is that this W12 norm is gonna be restricted to that domain. And now we get this extra area piece coming in. That's actually gonna be crucial, okay? So uh, what does this tell us? Well, now, um, using our, you know, just Kirby uniformization in this case, right, we can identify um, our max, sigma one maximizing metrics with some circle domains and complement of geodesic disks in S2. We can arrange the boundary length measure is balanced with respect to the coordinate functions. And then we see from this inequality that the gap between the associated eigenvalues is going to be bounded from below by this W12 dual squared difference and the area of the complement of that domain. So in other words, the you know, total areas of the geodesic uh, disks. All right, so the bound on the areas of geodesic disks, we, we have then a, a log k over k bound, right, the manure upper bound. So we conclude that most of the k geodesic disks that we removed to obtain this domain omega k have to have radius at most k to the minus alpha where alpha is any fixed number between a half and one. So I think we use three fourths right in the paper. So that's somehow the key point. Um, and then using a suitable choice of test function, so with this area bound, we know that most of these disks that we've removed have a small radius, uh, much less than uh, one over square root of k. And then using that, we can build a test function, which we plug into then this W12 dual comparison to get the desired lower bound for 
lambda one of s two minus sigma one of n tau. So just a, a remark I want to make here. So this this maybe will just just be for the the experts on this stuff. Is that you know when we're doing these comparisons of the Steklov eigenvalues to the Laplacian eigenvalues in the closed guy, we have this intermediate step often right. We're comparing the Steklov eigenvalues, which are you know lambda one of the domain with the boundary measure, right? And then we have in between lambda one of m with respect to that boundary length measure, and then on the other side of that we have lambda one of m for you know whatever our our, our conformal max or whatever. So the point I want to make for the, for the experts, the handful of people who they thought about this stuff a lot is that if instead of looking at the max of the Steklov eigenvalues, we looked at the max of lambda one of m with respect to those boundary measures on domains, let's say, k components, then I think we would get one over k instead of log k over k, with the maximizer being something like uh, where the disks that we're removing have actually comparable radius to the distance between them. So we have disks of radius like one over root k, a distance like one over root k apart. So there's actually a qualitative difference and well, in particular, quantitative difference between um, maximizing over the eigenvalues of the closed surface and these boundary length measures, the, the actual Steklov maximization problem. We'd lose our log k part here if we did that estimate instead, which is what we were trying to do at first, and we realized it wasn't good. Okay, so that's maybe just a, a technical point for experts. But in any case, uh, that gives the proof in the S2 case of uh, this uh, sharp log k over k lower bound. And uh, as I sort of indicated to Jean, um, we get something similar for RP2, T2, and the Klein bottle K, where um, the point is we have to use sort of different families of maps where Hirsch uses the conformal automorphisms of S2. Okay, but I'll uh, stop there. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk, Daniel. And uh, now we have time for questions. So, um, Please just uh, unmute yourself or uh, write your question in the chat and I will uh, relay them or Daniel will answer. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, uh, Daniel, uh, could you please repeat this technical point that you made at the very end about losing the log? Yeah. So my assertion, which, you know, I, it's not something we've checked super carefully, but we're pretty sure it's true. Okay, so suppose instead of looking at this, you know, sigma one of n k given by maximizing sigma one over surfaces of genus of uh, k boundary components, say in genus zero, mm -hmm. suppose you looked at um, the maximum of the first eigenvalue in S two of a measure given, you know, supported on say k curves inside S two. Mm -hmm. My claim is that if we took that maximum, where now we're looking at the Dirichlet energy on both sides of those curves. That the max for that should be within one over k of our Laplacian max instead of log k over k. And somehow the, the key point there is when we're doing a variant of those our stability results, right? That the key thing we gain is we look at this extra area piece here. So when we lose that area estimate, um, so for instance, and, and that's again why I said I think the, the maximizing configuration for that two-sided problem would actually be where the the amount of area that the disks are taking up. Is comparable to the area of their complement. Yeah, that, that, that's the assertion. I see. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else wants to ask a question? There's a perhaps a. Oh, some questions in chat. I see. In the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, that's right. So, so Asma was asking if log k should be log k plus one. So yes, if if k is uh, zero. <laughs> Or, uh, or one that should certainly be the case, right? But, uh, but yeah, so this is, I, I just mean it asymptotically. So log, you know, k plus two, if you like. Yeah, it's a fair question. So do you have any idea of uh, estimates on the constant C that appears there? Ah, so uh, I don't have any guesses for what the constant should be. I mean, basically I think figuring out, going from the rate of convergence to the actual, you know, getting an actual asymptotic expansion for the sigma one of nk in terms of lambda one of m, I think well, it should I, hand in hand. Aiming at the, what happens for small k, does it give information for small k or or not really? For small k, um, yeah. let's see. I mean, I, I guess I'll say you can. I mean, if you think about it, you can squeeze explicit constants out of what we do, but I mean, I don't think those will be sharp. Okay. So. Um, 
I mean, to get sharp constants, it should go hand in hand with really getting a, a more refined asymptotic analysis of what's happening, what these metrics look like. You know, mm -hmm. on a fine scale, you know, if you blow up at small scales, how are they really deviating from the closed guy? Um, and there are lots of questions you can ask about, you know, refining this picture, right? Our, our convergence we have is is a good first step, but of course, it's you know, it's kind of a weak convergence statement. The question is, you know, as you zoom in, it's really happening. What these metrics really look like, and then that should go hand in hand with getting finer estimates of these constants. Yeah, I, I, I actually, th uh, I'm really interested in in, in 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 your answer to that question in the high, in the large key uh, uh, regime. In fact, uh, so you're talking about asymptotic expansions. Uh, so would you, do you mean that <clears throat> you'd be interesting interested in finding um, what the correctors would be? Uh, uh, uh. I just mean you know so so what, what do we get we we show we have this this rate of convergence now so that's nice yeah and you can ask is what's the constant in front of that rate if a limit does exist right and then of course if, you know if you're having fun with there maybe you can go on to ask what the next terms are right but I mean, no, uh, no, no, no. Do, yeah. do you, that's why do do you have an idea from the construction of what that next term should be in in yeah. any ways does it appear as a I, I don't have a guess. I'm ready to venture for that for now. I mean, it's again, I think it goes hand in hand with getting a refined picture of what these geometries really are doing. Yeah. I mean, I think I think that it would be interesting just from the fact that we have we, we know that there will not be um, C1 or C2 convergence uh, uh, in 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 any sort of way. So understanding these correctors uh, after that, I think would would give yeah. us a prettier picture in the way that you have this this determinant. Absolutely. So I mean, it's it's there are lots of questions you can ask about getting a more refined picture of the convergence. Those are all interesting. So you can ask you now. There are very basic things, right? So for instance, um, you know, in the naive picture, one would expect the lengths of each boundary component to be comparable to one another, right? You don't expect to have one, you know, really large one, one really small one, or something. But we don't know that. Even that's you know one place to start. Are the lengths comparable? Then you can play around with you know in our construction that gives us the you know the upper bound on the gap. You know, if you optimize. You know, Get some explicit constants there, and maybe you know, maybe by optimizing that construction, you'll get the right constant from log k over k. So getting it in the lower bound would be more tricky, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, anyone else wants to uh, say something, ask something? So uh, I have a um, um, special question. <laughs> Okay. In the paper, there's a long list of uh, open problems uh, uh, that you propose as well. Yeah, a lot of them having to do with this question of refining the convergent picture. Yeah. You, you have a favorite one? A favorite one. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, instead of a favorite one, I'll tell you my least favorite one. <laughs> my least favorite one is I have this one. Um, the question is, if you know that your limit closed minimal surface is embedded, which, for instance, we know for you know the genus zero, uh, genus one, fine bottle RP two. If it's an embedded minimal surface, do the free boundary minimal immersions given from stack block maximization are they embedded for large k? And the thing is, if you're used to you know minimal surface and geometric measure theory stuff, then if you're having say you know a sequence of you know even weak minimal surfaces, singular you know if you have these weak minimal surfaces, these stationary variables in some fixed domain, you have all these nice Persistence of singularities results, which tell you that if your limiting object is smooth and embedded, right? Then you're you have to be smooth and embedded sufficiently far down the sequence. So here we have this weird phenomenon of these free boundary guys leaking out to the boundary, and somehow there's a change in the kind of monotonicity for area results you get when you leak out to the boundary that prevent you from getting a clean persistence of singularity result like this. And there are there are simple examples where you don't if you have you know like weak you know, so for instance, if you take inscribed polyhedra, regular polyhedra in the disk, then the, these curves will be, you know, weak free boundary geodesics in the disk, where you have singularities, but they converge as the number of, um, you know, as the number of vertices goes to infinity to the smooth uh, epsilon. So you don't have persistence of singularities there. But, um, so the question is though, if for these, you know, these actual nice guys that are honest free boundary minimal surfaces, um, you have persistence of singularities there. And that's one where <laughs> that wouldn't necessarily tell you that much about the geometries. It's just as someone who thinks a lot about geometric measure theory, it frustrates me that we couldn't, uh, you know, answer that easily. So that's that's one that I don't don't like. Um, as far as ones that I like, there are all these questions about you know coming up with their refined picture of the convergence. And I think I think investigating any of those would be a, you know would be useful if you can make any progress on the app. 
And perhaps one, is, is anyone else? I want to ask something else if nobody has a question, but I don't want to take this. If, if, can you say something about the situation in Genus 2 when it's not unique? What's the, when, that, when the, there's a, is, is there no, no, the, the estimates for the gap or something or? No, but like, like uh, is there a special phenomena there to, to understand because the, the maximizer for the closed surface is not itself unique? Yeah, so I mean, in general, as you can see, Genus 2 is left out of our list of quantitative results. Right, and it's um, similarly in the paper with with um, Nahon and Bolterovich. It's, it's just kind of a pest. Um, no, I mean, and you know, so there are simple questions you can ask. So in that case, you know, in the limit, we know we're branch cover of S two. So you can ask, you know, is that going to be true, you know, for the Steklov maximizers as well? Are they going to be, you know, branch covers over a two dimensional guy, or are they just going to be, you know, higher dimensional guys that sort of collapse in the limit of this equatorial S two? Um, no, so we, we have some questions in, in the, the question section about how to get refined asymptotics there, but I, uh, I, I don't know how to answer them. <laughs> They're open. <laughs> That's fine, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, one last time I will ask, does uh, anyone want to say something, ask something? If not, let's thank Daniel again. Thank you very much. It's fun.